Uh, welcome, everybody. One of a number of benefits that we get from programs like the uh, Center for Advanced Study Initiative on Immigration is that we're able to bring in uh, distinguished speakers from the outside. Nancy Foner is somebody that um, we've wanted to have on campus for quite a while, and this has finally worked out, and it's really a great pleasure to uh, introduce her to you. When we chose, I think when you're sitting out there in the audience, I was just thinking about this as Gail was talking about the upcoming events, it may seem like the schedule is that you have this speaker, and then you have that speaker, and then you have this other speaker. Actually, there is some design uh, to the program this year. And with regard to these uh, large public lectures, one of the things that we were aiming at was speakers that would be able to approach the subject of immigration in a very broad kind of fashion. And I'm really quite sure that you'll see that today. Uh, Nancy Foner is Distinguished Professor of Sociology at Hunter College and at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. Her BA is from Brandeis University. Her PhD is from the University of Chicago. And she reminded me, even though I confess that I, I really think of her as a sociologist, she reminded me that she has an earlier life uh, doing ethnographic work and a background in uh, anthropology. Uh, her main area of interest is immigration history. Uh, but under that broad rubric, she's really worked on a lot of uh, uh, different uh, groups and different kinds of problems. Uh, early on, uh, she did a lot of work on West Indian immigrants and, as I mentioned, has done uh, ethnographic uh, field work uh, as well as other forms of uh, research. Nancy is the author or editor of 14 books, and mercifully, I'm not going to repeat all the uh, titles of these books, but. Uh, there's a couple of them that I just wanted to share with you. These are uh, uh, books that I think are particularly important and that people might uh, appreciate. Um, one is From Ellis Island to JFK, New York's Two Great Waves of Immigration. And as you'll recall from the flyer, uh, Nancy is going to be bold today and compare two great historic waves of immigration, uh, that taking place in the early 20th century and that taking place as we speak. A second book, In a New Land, A Comparative View of Immigration. And uh, a third, a collection of essays which mixes historical work with contemporary uh, sociological research is entitled Not Just Black and White, Historical and Contemporary Perspectives on Immigration, Race, and Ethnicity in the United States. Nancy's most recent book will appear in 2009, and this is a collection of uh, essays from scholars working on a variety of groups, but all focusing on intergenerational relations within immigrant uh, families. It's this um, comparative work uh, between historical generations of immigrants that uh, has been most important for me. And I, I think it's remarkable in some ways how little of this kind of work that we have. We were talking about it earlier. And um, most historians, not all, some are very brave, uh, but most historians are, are fairly circumspect in terms of these kind of broad comparisons. And maybe it's a brilliant historical sociologist that has to come along and sort of stimulate us uh, with regard to this uh, kind of thinking. Um, I'd like you to ask you to think a little bit about this issue of immigration in the broadest possible uh, perspective uh, as uh, Nancy uh, speaks to us today. And I'd also like to ask you to please uh, help me welcome Nancy Foner to the University of Illinois. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. And thank you, so, Jim, for inviting me and also for that wonderful introduction. Well, you can see the title of my talk, What's New About the New Immigrants? Although you'll see actually that the new immigrants aren't so new anymore. <laughs> By now, we're talking about uh, an immigration that's been going on for many decades. So let me just begin. And Jim has already told you that this is going to be a, 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 comp a talk comparing immigration in the past with immigration today to try to understand what's new today. And 
I'm going to be looking at what I call the two great waves of immigration, not that there weren't earlier waves of immigration before 100 years ago, but I'm looking at 100, my baseline really is 100 years ago when there was a massive immigration which dramatically changed the United States, and today and for the last four decades, there's been a similar influx transforming the nation. And there's been a popular notion, I think, to look back to the past with rose-colored glasses, with nostalgia to a so-called golden age of immigration, to romanticize or glorify the experiences of immigrants in the past, and to see immigrants today as overwhelmingly different and inferior. And I, as you can see, I say, this is wrong. And so the main theme of my talk today is going to be to look at what are the parallels with the past, what's new about immigration today, and also very briefly at the end to also look at another question which I think is also very important, and that is how the legacy of the past has helped to shape the immigrant experience today. So let me just start off with what these two great waves are. The last great wave that I'm going to be talking about is the one between roughly the 1880s and the early 1920s. The present wave it began in the late 1960s and, as we know, is still going strong. So what I want to start out with is the parallels. What is, this is the historical, <laughs> actually historians, when they look at immigration today in the past, do tend to emphasize the continuities. I think in part because they feel, and I feel, that those have so often been overlooked and there's a tendency to see everything today as different and unique. But we are, first of all, there are many parallels with the past. I just want to highlight six. So first, and this may be pretty obvious, but it needs saying, we are not experiencing large-scale immigration for the first time. And here's, these, this gives you the percentages. This is immigrants as a percentage of the U.S. population. And if you look at this, you will see that in 2006, which is the last year we've got you know, good figures for, 12.5%, we can call it 13%, of the U.S. population is foreign-born. But if you look back at the early 20th century, what do we see? The percentages are actually higher. So 100 years ago, between, look, between 1900 and 1920, the percentages were higher than they are today. Now, we may be moving, if you can see, if you look at the last few decades, you see that the, you know, the percentage is going up, 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 and that may continue to, you know, on an upward trend, but at least so far, the proportion of immigrants in the United States has still not reached early 20th century levels. Second, having to do with work and immigrants' place in the economy. Because many immigrants today arrive with low skill levels, don't know English, and are new to the country, like their predecessors 100 years ago, they often enter the economy on the bottom. And I say often because not all do, and we'll come to that later. Many of them take, often take jobs, low-paid jobs with long hours and unpleasant working conditions in jobs that nobody else wants. And some of the jobs are even exactly the same. Working in garment sweatshops, for example, taking care of the gardens and children of the well-to-do. Uh, you know, and I look in, I'm, I'm a New Yorker, so my examples tend to come from New York, but in the suburbs of New York, for example, a hundred years ago, Italians were the gardeners in the estates, well now the people taking care of gardens in suburban New York are often Mexicans uh, and Guatemalans and Ecuadorans. Where immigrants live, another parallel. Many newcomers today, like those a century ago, cluster in ethnic residential enclaves, often sharing homes or apartment buildings with people from their home communities and giving many neighborhoods a distinct ethnic flavor. This is partly, we might discuss later, out of constraint, clearly, out of prejudice, out of financial constraints, but also because people would like to live near people from their home countries who speak their language in communities where they share their, their institutions and foods from home. Also, their low incomes and recent entry into the housing market force many immigrant families today, as in the past, into crowded, sometimes, oh, some step, whoops, some, sometimes substandard living quarters and to rent out space to their compatriots in order to make ends meet. So that's another similarity or parallel. 
the question of race. Now, this is a, a, a less expected parallel with the past. Um, one of the distinctions is very often said, and if you look at, often newspaper reports will have this, or uh, commonly social science, even social science writings. What is the difference between today and the past? Well, in the past, the immigrants were mostly and overwhelmingly white, whereas today they're people of color. But this is really a misreading or a misunderstanding of immigration in the past. Southern and Eastern European immigrants a century ago were not viewed as white in the same way that people with origins in Northern and Western Europe were. They were seen as inferior whites, as some historians have called them probationary whites, or as Jim Barrett and David Rodiger have written in their award-winning article and other, um, and other places, in between peoples is a phrase that is often used. Um, a similarity, whoops, between, whoops, yes, that's right. A similarity between today and the past is the prejudice that many immigrants experience, prejudice that is often justified on the grounds of racial inferiority. A hundred years ago, and it's interesting how quickly we forget, and again, as I say, I'm, I, I often give these talks uh, on, on the past and the present in New York, which is a city which has many uh, descendants of the earlier uh, Eastern European and Italian immigration, and their descendants are almost, sometimes when I put these, uh, you know, I, I give these talks, people are very surprised, they really forget. A hundred years ago, a common belief was that Southern Italian and Eastern European Jewish immigrants belonged to inferior mongrel races that were polluting the nation's Anglo-Saxon or Nordic stock. Jewish racial features, it was argued, made them unassimilable. Italians were often described as swarthy. Uh, there was actually a doctor, doctor, uh, a medical researcher at Bellevue Hospital in, in New York City in the early 20th century who actually did a study in which he, count, he, he got a lot of Jewish immigrants together, or he interviewed them, at, basically to count their, look at their noses and he did a study of the Jewish nose because he wanted to refute the stereotype that you could tell that someone looked Jewish by their nose. And he found that most Jewish immigrants did not have the stereotypical Jewish nose. He himself, by the way, was a Jewish immigrant, as I've said. Uh, Vice President, well, then Vice President Calvin Coolidge, just to show you how widespread these kinds of, and, and acceptable, these kinds of feel statements were wrote, America must be kept American. Biological laws show that Nordics deteriorate when mixed with other races. Uh, there was really a tremendous concern that these immigrants were polluting America's racial stock. The racial attack on Southern and Eastern European immigrants was a powerful move, uh, weapon in the movement to reduce immigration and helped to mobilize public sentiment in favor of restrictive legislation. And ultimately, the restrictionists did win, and legislation in 1924 instituted a national origins quota system, which really marked the end of massive uh, influx of Southern and, and Eastern uh, European migration. Transnational ties. This is uh, transnationalism or maintaining political, social, economic, and cultural ties to the home country is not a new invention. And I should say, I've written quite a bit about this, and early on in the literature when transnationalism, I, historians, will, historians have always written about ties that immigrants maintain to their home country. But the conception of transnationalism, as it was developed by scholars in the 1990s, the initial writings treated transnationalism as if it was something altogether new. Well, that's not true. And actually, many of those same scholars have backtracked <laughs> and now recognize that it's not new. Many immigrants in the last great wave of immigration maintained extensive transnational ties. They sent money home, they sent letters home, they put away money to buy land and houses in the home community. Large numbers of Italians, were, who were often referred to as birds of passage, engaged in circular migration. They would go back to their home village seasonally or every few years, many of them would come to the US, um, do work during the summer months or the warm months, go back to Italy when it got cold. Many immigrants in a variety of groups remained actively involved in the politics of their homeland. And some homeland governments, Italy being a prime example, 
were also involved with their citizens in the US, subsidizing organizations to help them, and for example, facilitating the flow of remittances homeward in the Italian case by setting up certain banks for them to use. Learning English, uh, this is something I hear about all the time. Um, I, uh, you know, even after, I have to just say, after I'll give talks about this often in New York, a hand will go up in the audience and someone will say, but my grandparents, they knew English when they come. And today's immigrants, they don't know English. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. That's misleading. A common fear today is that today's immigrants and their children are not learning English and that this is different from the past. That in fact, today's immigrants are not learning English, but whereas they learned it in the past. But when it comes to language, the similarities with the past really stand out. And the fears that immigrants and their children today will not learn English are unfounded. The standard three generation model of linguistic assimilation still holds. Generally, the immigrant generation arriving as adults makes some progress, but is usually more comfortable and fluent in the native tongue. Not surprising. Although, remember, I should also say another difference, well, a difference between then and, to, and now is that some, English, some immigrants today actually are English speaking when they come. I mean, they, their native tongue is English, but okay. For those who it's not English, they usually are more comfortable in their native tongue. The second generation, and by the second generation, which is a term that's gonna crop up, I mean the children of immigrants who were born in the US, okay, to immigrant parents, US born children to immigrant parents. The second generation is generally bilingual, and the third generation is overwhelmingly monolingual in English. So that three generation progression is what we found in the past, and what we're finding today. I mean, we know that we found that in the past, and that's what studies show we're finding today. A study using 2000 census data show that among immigrants from non-English speaking countries, only 10% didn't speak English at all. Now again, these are self-report data, so they may be, you know, they've got that problem, but still 10% is, is small. As in the past, there is a strong positive association between the length of time an immigrant has lived in the US and the ability to speak English well, which of course also makes sense. In the second generation today, the vast majority has made the transition to English. They're much more likely to speak English fluently than their immigrant parents. They're far less likely than their parents to speak with an accent. And this is true even in parts of the US where Spanish is widely spoken and even when the media and the parents' original language are widely available. In a recent study found, and this was a Pew Research Center report, a study found that 88% of the second generation Latinos 18 and older spoke English very well versus about a quarter of first generation Latino immigrants. In short, there is little evidence that maintaining the parental language comes at the expense of English fluency, even among those groups in which second generation bilingualism is common. So, and once again, third generate, by the third generation, English monolingualism is the dominant pattern among, for over 90% of Asian groups and as high as two thirds for the Mexican third generation. Now, so those are parallels, okay? But of course, there are many differences between then and now because the immigrants them are different, because the United States is different, because the world is different. And you know, we cannot overlook, obviously, these many differences. So there is, in fact, much that is new about immigration today. And I want to just go through some of those things. First of all, in terms of who the immigrants are and the nature or the nature of the immigrant flows. A hundred years ago, the overwhelming majority of immigrants to the US were from Europe, mainly from Eastern and Southern Europe. Italians were the largest group in the first two decades of the, second, of the 20th century, followed by Eastern European Jews. In 1920, an astounding 94% of the nation's immigrants were European. Today, in 2007, 13% were European. So obviously that's a very big difference. I mean, the United States is still receiving European immigrants, but the num obviously the percentage, the numbers and the percentages are much smaller. In 2007, four of five immigrants living in the US were from Latin America, Asia, and the Caribbean. About a quarter were from Asia, 
and 55% from Latin America and the Caribbean. Now, obviously, that's a very big difference from the past. The top three groups are Mexicans, Chinese, and Indians. And let me give you the figures you'll see here. I mean, this is the, these are the top 10 groups of immigrants in the United States in 2007. When I say that, I don't mean the, num the immigrants who came to the US in 2007. This is the count of all the immigrants in the United States in 2007, a census figures, OK? So you can see that overwhelmingly, Mexicans are the largest group. They are almost a third of all the immigrants in the US. And that really stands out, because look at the next group, Chinese. They're 5.4%. I mean, much, much smaller percentage. And then Indians, 4.6. I mean, you can go down the list. Mexicans are clearly overwhelmingly the larger group. But you can see that most of the 10 largest groups are from Asia and uh, Latin America. Uh, immigrants today may be a lower percentage of the nation's population than in 1910, but there are many more of them. In 1910, let me just show, let me go to this. Uh, you can see in 1910, uh, there were 13.5 million immigrants in the United States. You looked at 2006, 37.5 uh, million. Basically, there are 38 million immigrants in the United States today. Those numbers are unprecedented. So the proportion is lower, but the actual number is very, very, is much larger. Unauthorized immigrants, I know I'm running through a lot of these points, and that's an issue, obviously, of great public concern. A hundred years ago, there were few restrictions on European immigration, so that hardly any European immigrants were so-called illegal, unauthorized, undocumented. Until the 1920s, there were no numerical limits on European immigration. When it came to Europeans, you didn't have to get a visa to come to the United States. You didn't need any special papers to, from the US, uh, so that you know, they were basically almost, there were no limits on who could come from Europe. I say from Europe, and you see the parentheses, because that was not true from Asia. Starting in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act barred Asia, Chinese immigration. Subsequently, uh, this was extended to other Asians. So Asians were pretty much barred from entry to the US. But for Europeans in this period, they had the right of free entry. Uh, they came by boat. Most got through the ports very easily. Mostly this was Ellis Island. Since they'd already been screened mostly for disease on, by the steamship companies before being allowed on the boat. The reason for that, the US passed a law which said that the steamship companies were responsible. If you didn't get through Ellis Island, the steamship companies had to pay for the passage of those who were rejected to ship them back to Europe. Now, obviously, the steamship companies didn't want to do that. So they instituted their own inspections in Europe before people even got on the boat. So actually, the, I, I don't know the stereotype, at least in my mind often, and that people of is Ellis Island was this terrifying experience where people were you know, sent back. But if you actually look at the figures, only 1% of the 25 million immigrants who landed at Ellis Island before World War I were excluded. Most of them got through fairly easily. The big thing was getting onto the boat in the first place in Europe. Today, if you don't have authorization by US authorities, you can't legally live and work in the US. There are definitely <laughs> numerical limits on the number of immigrant visas. I'm not going to go into all the details, but there are def numerical limits on the number of immigrant visas allowed overall and per country. And in many countries, there is a long wait to get them, even if you have a family member to sponsor you. And most immigrants to the US come through family reunification provisions of US immigration law. Something like 75 to 80 percent. Others come in through occupation. Most people come because they have a family member here who can, will sponsor them. In, however, the weights, particularly from some countries, for some categories, is extraordinarily long. So in 2007, a US citizen wanting to sponsor an unmarried adult child, and bear in mind, this is an adult child. Uh, from Mexico or the Philippines had to wait more than 15 years before the application would be processed. So there are very, very long waits, even if you've got a family member to sponsor you from certain countries, because so many people are applying for visas. The result is that many arrive, and by the way, and also some people don't have a family member to sponsor them, you know, close enough to get them in, because, um, well, to go in, the best thing is to have, be sponsored clearly, to be a minor child sponsored by a parent. 
um, or a spouse sponsored by a, by your spouse, um, but not, not everybody has somebody that close to sponsor you, or who's a legal resident, or even better, a citizen. The result of this, these long waits and the need to have family members to sponsor you is that many arrive or remain without proper documents. Um, and I should say, not everybody, get, you know, many, many immigrants arrive with proper documents. They don't come, quote, illegally. They come perfectly legally with a tourist visa or a student visa, but they overstay their visa. Others come in, particularly across the border, without proper documents to begin with. Whatever, the latest estimate, we have a huge number of undocumented immigrants in the United States. The latest, it's 11 to 12 million. The latest figure I saw was something like 11.8 million unauthorized immigrants living in the US. More than half of them are from Mexico. That's obviously, and unlike anything, 100 years ago. The social and economic backgrounds of immigrants is also different. First, one of the things that stands out about today's immigration is the remarkable diversity of the backgrounds of immigrants. It's not just that they come from all over the world in large numbers. It's we're talking about their occupational, educational, and social class background. Many of today's immigrants are still poorly educated and low skilled. About a third, you can see, of the nation's foreign born 25 and older, lacked a high school diploma in 2006, but substantial numbers now come with college degrees or more. In 2006, 27% of the nation's foreign born 25 and older were college graduates. Many people don't know, you know, think of that. I mean, their images, I think if you ask people, what's your image of an immigrant today? Many people, first of all, would say undocumented. And not, although there are many undocumented, the vast majority of immigrants are what? Legal residents of the US. And also, they would say it's somebody low skilled. That's, there are a substantial number of immigrants with high skills and high levels of education. In fact, never before in US history have there been such a high percentage who have arrived with such high educational qualifications. Now, of course, they may not be able to practice the occupation that they were trained for back home because they don't speak English, because they don't have li can't meet licensing requirements, but they come highly, many come highly educated. Where immigrants live. A hundred years ago, most European immigrants went to the Northeast and Midwest, not surprising. This is where most of the people in the nation lived. I mean, they were going where there were jobs, where there were cities, where most of the population was. Today, large numbers also go to the Southwest, West, and South, most notably California, Texas, and Florida. Now, although immigrants are now more spread out around the country and dispersing to new destinations, and that is a phenomenon, again, I'll come back to, of the very recent times of about a decade ago, really, the recent immigration is more concentrated in particular states and metro regions than 100 years ago. In 2007, almost two-thirds of all immigrants in the US lived in just six states, and you will see that Illinois is one of them. Uh, California, you see, has the largest uh, immigrant population in the nation, 9.9 .9 million, followed by New York, you can see 4.1 million. This is the states, okay? Florida, 3.5 million, Texas, 3.4 million, New Jersey, 1.9 million, Illinois, 1.7 million, and Georgia, which is interesting because that's a real, relatively new destination, uh, 953,000. About one third, actually I think this is a pretty phenomenal figure, about one third of the nation's immigrants live in two urban metropolitan regions, New York and Los Angeles. I mean, uh, there is a lot of, we'll, and we'll, again, I hope we'll talk more about it, there's been a movement of immigrants in the last 10, 15 years to non-traditional gateways, which is what they're often called in the South and in the Midwest. New York and Los Angeles are still are the real immigrant capitals of America. They have a huge proportion of the nation's immigrant population. First stop suburbia is something new too today. Suburbanization, of course, is a fact of life in America today, and immigrants, like other Americans, often go to live there. I think what's new is not that they go to live there, it's that they go to live there, in many cases, first. They don't even stop in the cities. They, many of them go to suburbia right away. Highly educated immigrants are especially likely to settle in middle-class suburban neighborhoods with better neighborhoods, amenities, and schools. Jobs and the economy, fifth. 
Given that a substantial number of minority of today's immigrants have college degrees, and some bring substantial amounts of financial capital, it's not surprising that many arrive ready and able to find decent, sometimes high-level jobs in the mainstream economy. So, you know, there are immigrant doctors, nurses, engineers, computer programmers, and this is another difference from the past, and also, again, I guess a sort of obvious point, but worth saying, in our post-industrial service economy, fewer immigrants work in factories, more in the service sector than in the past. Legal status wasn't an issue for European immigrants 100 years ago, as I've said. Uh, it is for many immigrants today. Now, having a green card, you know, or a, being a legal permanent resident is not a recipe for success necessarily, but without one, an immigrant has much more trouble getting a good job, making a living wage in the formal economy, is liable, as we've also seen from newspaper accounts, to deportation uh, and arrest. And this has enormous ramifications for their own lives and it's likely, I think, for the lives of their children as well. Sixth, the final difference, transnationalism. What's new about transnationalism? And although immigrants have always been transnational, uh, transnationalism, there are many new dynamics to transnationalism today, a lot having to do with modern technology and communications because immigrants can maintain a kind of frequent, immediate, intense, close contact with their home societies in a way that simply was not possible 100 years ago. A century ago, it took two letters for a letter to get to Italy, another two, week, um, two weeks, another two weeks for the letter to come back. Today, of course, you can make a phone call, you can get on a plane, plane fares are still not, you know, still reasonable. Um, you can, people prepay, they're cheap, we live in an era of cheap phone calls, right, and they keep getting cheaper, uh, and there are new types of communications such as email, videotapes, uh, video conferencing, and I have to say, I, I have to tell you that I was a little bit of a skeptic about this, and I was, you know, saying, oh, all this technology, you know, this is just for the elite, you know, not everybody can do it. And yet I think many people who are even not in the elite are, are maintaining contact with their home countries in some of these ways. Uh, just an example, a group that I study in New York, Jamaicans, um, I was uh, been told that many Jamaican women who work in cleaning jobs, you know, when the, the, everyone goes home and they're in the offices, they're emailing their relatives back home. Yeah, so, I mean, people are creative, right? Um, and that means that people, enough people are, are having them back home or are, going, are able to go to places where they can, you know, log on. Um, in terms of phones, I, I often think of the case of, of Jamaica, which is, uh, to come back, that's where I started out my academic career, doing field work in a village in Jamaica in the late 1960s. And when I was there in the late 1960s, the only kind of instantaneous communication was through uh, telegram. And there was one, there was a postmistress. She had her little place where she was. And if anybody wanted to reach you right away, they had to send a telegram, which wasn't so great because she read them all. So it wasn't exactly private. And people, unless it was a real emergency, you didn't use that. So there was no phone, there were no phones. After I left the community, actually just as I was leaving, I think it was 1969 and 70, they put in one phone booth in the village, I guess the equivalent of the village square. But that was actually pretty far from where most people lived. And you know, if you wanted to make a phone call, there were usually lines you know, to make a call. And if you wanted someone to call you, you had to make an appointment. It was very complicated. Uh, a bit later on, some people, the better off, uh, got phones, private phones, but they were very unreliable. The phone lines were always not working in Jamaica, and not, not every, certainly far from everybody had them. In the last few years, what's happened is really a revolution of, of cell phones. Um, a recent article, I mean, this, I, I guess this just really uh, amazed me, so I don't know, maybe it'll there are In Jamaica, there are a little under three million people who live in the island. Um, as uh, there are 2.1 million cell phones. Now that's kind of amazing. If, <laughs> that's an amazing figure. What's happened is people are, you know, have complete, and what they're doing, they're not only calling people in Jamaica, they're calling their relatives in New York, they're calling their relatives in Toronto, they're calling their relatives in, 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 in Florida, they're speaking to them several times a day. It's cheap. You know, you get these phone cards and it's really quite inexpensive. And I think one of the interesting things, you know, for further study is how the access to phone, these, these cheap calls and, the, and cell phones in, in communities like this 
are really changing the nature of relations between people when they're, when they're abroad and they're, they're relatives who've migrated because the, this kind of constant phone communication. In fact, one of the things that one of the people who has studied this says is that it actually created a lot of new demands on people. <laughs> is that their relatives in new, you know, at home are often making new demands on them. Uh, but in any case, I, I think it's an interest. It certainly changed the nature of relations between people and their home in, here and in their home country. Uh, another important thing, and I can just mention, is the fact that a number of countries, a growing number of countries, now allow dual citizenship. What that means is that they allow their citizens of their country, if they become US citizens, to also hold on to their home country citizenship. Uh, this is a development really of the last 10, 15 years, and, and more and more countries are allowing this um, for a variety of reasons, one of them being remittances that they want to in ensure. Uh, a number of countries also are allowing their nationals, whether they have American citizenship too or not, to vote in elections for the home country elections in the United States. So far, not that many people are taking advantage of that, but I think growing numbers will, and that's a very interesting development. That's something new. Continuing immigration. I think that's something really important. In the past, there was a halt in mass immigration from southern, whoops, you can see that I didn't spell that right. <laughs> southern and Eastern Europe in the 1920s as a result of legislation in the 1920s that restricted immigration and then followed by the Great Depression and World War II. So that we really had a period when they were from Eastern and Southern Europe, you did not have much immigration at all after in the mid 19, the late 1920s and immigration didn't really start in a massive scale until the 1960s. What that meant, and I think this really is something to bear in mind, the children of the Italian, the Jewish, the Polish immigrants who came in the early 20th century, as their children were growing up and coming into adulthood in the 30s and the 40s and 50s, they were coming up and, and growing up into adulthood at a time when there were no new recruits really coming in from their home country. Um, and that changed the whole process of assimilation, I think. Today, this is different because immigration has been continuing at high rates, and at least so far, a halt, anything like the past, is unlikely. Just to give you an idea, because I think this is quite interesting, you know, is a figure worth considering. In 2006, 30% of immigrants to the U.S. came between 1990 and 1999. A quarter of all of the immigrants in the U.S. in 2006 had come in the last six years. More than 55% of the immigrants in the United States in 2006 came after 1990. They're recent immigrants. They've been, there's been a big, many children of immigrants grow up today in communities where newcomers of all ages, children, grown-ups, older people, are arriving every day and they have strong ties to their home country, they practice the home country customs, speak the home country languages. Um, I think many, this is, an, in, this is, by the way, I think one of the reasons for some mis, um, uh, why people, for example, if they see young people speaking Spanish or speaking a home country language, they say, oh, the children aren't learning English. Well, because many of the people first, maybe second generation, who speak both English and Spanish or English in their home country language, but also many of the people that they see who are young just came, you know, two weeks ago. They're not, you know, many of them are very recent immigrants. Many of the ethnic groups involved in immigration today are likely to continue to be dominated by the first and second generations for the next half century. And again, I think that is something new, at least for the Eastern and Southern European immigration. When I speak to the historians, Irish immigration, of course, was one that was replenished. Um, finally, I just want to add just a few words about the, how the legacy of the past shapes the present. Because I think it's not just a question of what's different between now and then, it's how the incorporation of newcomers in the past or the legacy of immigration has shaped the contemporary immigration experience. This is very visible in a place like New York, which has had, you know, is a truly immigrant city and has had very high levels of immigration over the 20th century where a variety of institutions were established early in the 20th century, often by immigrants themselves to aid newcomers. And those very same institutions that were formed 100 years ago are actually helping immigrants today. 
labor unions, you know, the class, one of the class of the internet, the, the garment workers union, it's now Unite, not the International Labor Garment Workers Union, settlement houses. Just a few weeks ago, I was giving a talk uh, in honor of a book that came out on Jacob Rees, and it was actually sponsored by the Jacob Rees Settlement House, and we were hearing about how uh, in fact, there was a talk about the settlement houses that were formed 100 years ago to, in New York that are, are serving immigrants today. Um, today's immigrants profit from the legitimacy of ethnic politics dating back to the 19th century when the Irish were able to infiltrate and take over the helm of big city democratic politics by mobilizing the ethnic vote. Uh, that's a historical experience, but ethnic politics is something that's certainly widely accepted in America today. And I think it's important to add that new immigrants and their children have also benefited from the gains won by African Americans in the civil rights movement. Now, I also want to say that many immigrants also suffer from the legacy of segregation and slavery. So, I mean, it's not a one-sided thing. But many immigrants clearly have and, and have benefited from greater opportunities that have been provided, diversity programs, affirmative af action programs, um, just to give one statistic, at, uh, at there's a, a, a well-known study of uh, elite uni universities and colleges in the United States, actually done by Doug Massey, who was here right last year, and some of his colleagues, and they found that over a quarter of the, um, the non-Hispanic black students at elite colleges and universities were uh, children, uh, foreign-born or children of foreign-born blacks. So, I mean, they are, been, you know, this is... Uh, a new etiquette also has about race and public discourse condemns racial, religious, and ethnic slurs by public officials and candidates. So, I am finally at the end. Um, as we look at immigration in the 20th century America, I think it's helpful to look at it with a historical sensibility to try to appreciate what's genuinely new about contemporary immigration as well as the ways that we've been there before. And I'd just like to end with a quote from the historian David Kennedy, which I think is a very nice way of putting it. He wrote, the only way we can know with certainty as we move along time's path that we have come to a new place is to know something of where we have been. So let me end there, and then we can open it up for, for questions. <laughs> I just have a quick factual question. Okay. Mm. Uh, maybe we'll take this one without the microphones. Quick, quick, quick factual question. Mm. The, the 37.5 million mm. current immigrants, does that include the undocumented? Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. it does. So yeah. 25 million roughly. Yeah, it, you know, again, remember the, esti the, the undocumented, you know, those are estimates, but yeah, yeah, but that 38 million includes that, yeah. What, it, it, it's not broken down by legal status. <laughs> Can you talk to us, um, you seem to have attacked many of the myths of, of, of the immigration debate, but one of them that uh, wasn't dealt with directly is uh, criminality, mm -hmm. crime in immigrant areas, mm -hmm. And then a related one, violence. Why would you say that in the US we have not had the kind of violence confrontation that Italy, France, and other countries are, are presently dealing with? Especially since we had uh, literally millions of immigrants in marches. Pardon me? I didn't hear the last part. Especially in the context of two years ago when we had so many people on the streets in marches mm -hmm. and we did not have the you know, what in France sparked in, in one corner and you just went through the whole country? Well, I guess the criminality issue is more myths about today. <laughs> I don't know about in terms of the past on this, um, but they were, Italians were thought of being, right, criminals, right, exactly, to take out their stilettos, right? That was one of the, the images of them. And today there is often an, a, a myth, I, I, really a myth, that immigrants have high rates of criminality. Actually, they have much lower rates of, 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 of of, of um, committing crimes than native-born Americans, yeah. I mean, that's what studies show all the time today. 
um, that their, their rates are much lower. Uh, so I guess that's a myth both about the past and the present, right? That their rates are much, their rates of, of, uh, of, of, of committing crimes are much lower than people both then and now have, have, have thought. Oh, that it takes a while, yeah. Kind of slow. Thank you. Um, so you um, spoke about the pre-1930 or pre-1940 uh, development of national quotas in immigration law, but mm -hmm. I wonder if you could give us a little history of the development of these very, um, what seemed to me these very sort of rigid and limiting immigration laws that we have now compared to, um, <laughs> except for the Chinese exclusion, I suppose, mm -hmm. compared to, um, mm -hmm. uh, say, 1908. You know, in U.S. immigration law is a kind of interesting thing because on the one hand, New American immigration law is actually quite expansive. We allow in large numbers of legal immigrants every year. And I, whoops. And paradoxically, um, every single law that's been passed since 1965 has actually expanded the number of legal immigrants who can enter. So actually, in terms of legal Im number of legal immigrants being able to enter, the law has actually expanded that continually since 1965. Now, the problem is obviously is that it's also obviously not expanded enough, particularly from certain countries, and the one that stands out most is Mexico, as we saw. I mean, 31% of America's immigrants are from Mexico, and Mexicans make up the bulk of the undocumented immigrant population. And part of the problem is, is that the immigration laws treat Mexico like any other country. I mean, you know, it treats it like Jamaica, I, much as I have my, you know, <laughs> I'm fond of Jamaica. I mean, Jamaica has three million people, under three million people. Mexico has many more people and, you know, much, and, and shares a border. And in fact, also, we have a free trade agreement with Mexico, and yet people are limited in their movement. So that's been the problem. I mean, it, one, of, I mean one of the main problems. So um, it's our actual, the laws in terms of legal immigration have actually expanded. I, I don't know if that will continue. I mean, even in the last, when, when Congress was discussing uh, what to do about the problem of undocumented immigration and whether to create pathways to legalization um, and citizenship ultimately, right, for, for, for undocumented immigrants, there weren't really calls to limit the number of legal immigrants, which is interesting. I mean, that hasn't been there still, and, and that, that's, that, that hasn't been, maybe that will come as the economy we don't know as the economy gets worse, perhaps there will be calls to restrict the number of legal immigrants. But the United States allows, you know, you know what the last year was, all, it was about six or 700,000, but in many years over the last stretch, it's been well over a million legal immigrants who've entered, which is actually in absolute numbers, the largest of any country in the world. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a it's, there's two sides of the story. I mean, I, I think a, a lot of the problem is, is undocumented immigration, particularly from Mexico and Latin America. I mean, in terms of their limits of being able to come. Good evening, Nancy. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that um, very enlightening talk. I noticed that you use the word, um, the term rather, assimilation. And I'm just wondering mm -hmm. um, how, does, how does sort of the newer debates that suggest that people, actually immigrants, didn't necessarily assimilate, but sort of the, the term that people are throwing around uh, for ex the idea of hybridity, so to speak, um, because I'm thinking about that in terms of transna the concept of transnationalism. And, and assimilation and transnationalism doesn't seem to, um, to sort of go hand in hand, if you, if, um, if you know what I mean. Like there's a, this idea of if people are in fact have these sort of transnational networks across borders, then, it, like, then are they really assimilating? Um, okay, that's a complicated question um, and a very good question. Um, 
I think my own view is that we have assimilation and transnationalism going on at the same time. I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. But I think you're right that there are new conceptions of assimilation that at the same time as immigrants are becoming, for want of a phrase, of, I don't know how, more American or becoming part of American society and adapting learning English, for example. Uh, we see patterns of intermarriage. We see, quote, residential assimilation. And as they move out of ethnic neighborhoods, in many cases, into neighborhoods with other, other folks. Uh, but at the same time, I, but I think one of the benefits of the new conceptions of assimilation is to say, well, Im that's looking at it, it's not just that immigrants are becoming, uh, changing themselves, changing and becoming more like other Americans, but they also are themselves changing America. And I think that is, they are reshaping America just as they reshaped America in the past. That's not something, that's, that's something that always has happened in American society. I think that is the, actually that, rather, I, I think that Immigrants can maintain ties to their home country and become and be involved in life in their home country at the same time as that they are involved in life here, as they become involved in political parties, as they go to religious congregations here, as they send their children to school here, as they learn English, as they may intermarry, as they intermix, as they become very involved with American society, whatever you want to call that, whether you. Um, and then they also maintain ties to their home country. The big question, if we come to the literature on assimilation, is we really, I, I don't think there's an expectation that immigrants, after all, particularly if they came here as adults or young adults, are going to give up many of their customs. I mean, they're going to maintain many of their home country customs, or maybe maintain is the wrong word, because they're going, you talked about hybridity. They're going to change and shift somewhat in the new environment, uh, but they're not, they're not, they're not going to be just like people who you know, lived here for generations and generations. Uh, but it's really among their children, the children of immigrants, and I think that's one of the reasons for the big interest now in second generation studies, uh, to see what happens with their children. And if we're looking at transnationalism among children, I think over, so far at least the literature is showing that the children are not that transnational. It varies by group and also by geographic location in the United States. You know, those who live in Southern California who are Mexicans, obviously they're close to the border. They may go back, uh, back and forth. In New York, we find that Dominicans, for example, the children of Dominicans tend to have closer ties to their home country than other groups. But by and large, most of the children of immigrants are firmly oriented to life in the United States. They may go on home visits, but many of them say that when they go home to their parents' home country, they feel more American. <laughs> it makes them feel more American. They realize how different they are from, you know, that they really are not, that they feel somewhat estranged from their home country. They're proud of, in, of their home country traditions. They're, 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 they don't distance themselves from it that much, but they don't, they feel American. And so I don't know, I, th I think that, so I think in many ways, if we're looking at issues of assimilation, I know to many people it's a dirty word. I don't know what other word to you, you know, integration, incorporation. I think that, you know, we can't not look at some of those processes. But at the same time, I think we also need to see how immigrants and their children are changing America. After all, if we've got, you know, large numbers and they're heavily concentrated in certain areas, they are they are clearly changing our country. I know you had, a, you had a session on food, right? That's one of the, food is one of the obvious, but there, but there are many, many ways in which they're changing, changing the country. Thank you very much. Uh, one question I just needed to make sure I'm understanding it right. Between 1980 census and 1990, the percentage Between 1980 of, and 1990. Yes, the yes. percentage of Im, uh, immigrants doubled almost. Does that have to do with the um, amnesty law? When you were that showing period, the percentage? Yeah, that period had a lot to do with the amnesty law. Because, you know, 1986 was the IRCA, right, the immigrant, it was passed. And so you had up until what, between 86 or whatever, up until what, 91 or 92, so you had over a million people legalizing that way. Yeah, so the numbers went way up. So, but this, so these percentages were the legal immigrants? The, the percentages that I gave you, right? Yeah. That, 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 those are not by legality. Those are just the immigrants who are counted by the US Census. Now, if anything, they're an undercount, right? <laughs> but, um, no, those, they don't distinguish between undocumented or documented. 
So when I said that, you know, 25% of the immigrants in the United States to, in 2006 came from 2000 to 2006, some of those are undocumented who are counted by the census. It doesn't differentiate. Is that clear? Or? Yeah, I have to work this out because if these were the same people that were in U.S. just got legalized in 18, 1980s. Well, not in 2000. The, 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 the legalization, those who got legalized by IRCA would be between about 1987 and 1991 yeah. or whenever the law, what was it, 1992. It was just a short period. But then, of course, they were then able to sponsor their relatives. You know, the way U.S. immigration Okay, so law. that would give rise to new immigrants. Yes, for every immigrant who comes here and has legal status, right? They can and bring in. They, and, and citizens, in particular, once you become a citizen, you can sponsor relatives. Okay, that is yeah. that may, That's the, what maybe you're... Okay, the other question But, but the, the cell system works that way on family reunification. Yeah. Do you know, um, do, can you tell us anything about the lottery visas mm. that were instituted, I think, 2001, 2003, sometime earlier on, right? Yeah, um, the 1990 bill set up, I don't know if people know about diversity visas. They were set up in, in typical fashion. I mean, U.S. immigration policy is very peculiar the way things get done. That was actually ad, it was sponsored by Ted Kennedy. And for, you know, to go back, I'm looking at Jim because of Irish immigration because there were a lot of um, undocumented, uh, illegal, uh, undocumented Irish immigrants. The Irish had a great deal of difficulty coming here because their immigration was so early. And so they didn't have relatives available to sponsor them, right? Because we're talking that it was their great grandparents or grand, they couldn't sponsor them. And he actually, insta one of the, he was an agitator for this, to put this into the law, uh, to give countries that had very few immigrants here a chance a chance to increase their numbers by making what are called diversity visas available to people from countries with very low immigration, okay? And that got, there are something like 60,000 a year, and they're allocated by, they, every year they decide which countries get it, <laughs> okay, how many they get. They're given to countries that have low numbers here. So I know in New York, for example, where I, where I do my studies mostly, the countries that benefited in New York, um, well, initially Ireland, uh, Bangladesh, um, uh, Pakistan, uh, Poland, some of the Eastern European countries. Given, although one of my students was telling me Poland's no longer on the list, they were very upset. It's now done by computer, too. You give your name and they do this lottery on computer and then see, they, people refer to it as, I won the lottery. <laughs> That's how they, you know, and then you get a visa to come here, okay? Um, but um, at, because of the family, as historians would call it, chain migration, sociologists would call it network-driven processes of immigration, you know, once you get a small, a, a number of people from a country who are allowed to come in or get these visas through the diversity program, what happens very quickly is they sponsor their relatives. And so what was a very small community becomes larger. African immigrants are also the ones who've been getting them. And we see that, you know, we see that in all, that, that happens. So that's another part. That was instituted in the early 90s. And it's still on operation. Oh, okay. Please, sorry, I cut you off earlier. I'm just trying to go in order. Oh, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Yeah. I'm working in the Department of Community Health here in the area of aging, and one of the hear me? One of the biggest challenges we see is uh, to afford an aging population here in the U.S. And I want to hear your thoughts on uh, how the immigrant population here is uh, intending to retire, uh -huh. where, and if there is any chances for policy uh, regarding to the immigration. So you're talking about aging immigrants. Right. Ah, oh, that's going to be an interesting question. Yes, I mean, that's interesting because most people, of course, migrate when they're in their young, healthy years. So as these immigrants come, they're going to be getting older. Well, one question you raised is where are they going to spend their retirement years? Are they going to return home? That's always been an issue, right, whether they're going to go back to retire. I think if you ask many immigrants, they'll say they are. And in fact, many immigrants are working hard here. And the whole reason they're working hard here and slaving away is to build a home often, you know, that they can retire to in their home community, you know, or maybe not, maybe a nicer place. I mean, there's a, a, well, there's a, a wonderful movie about Dominican immigrants in New York where the couple is working so hard, three jobs, slaving away, and they're building this house in the Dominican Republic, you know, brick, it's so slow, but you know, by the beach so they can retire. 
I mean, the question is often, you know, and I think that's the goal for many immigrants, not all, but for many, that they would like to retire to their home countries. In the case of some in the Caribbean, which is close, um, or I'm, I'm sure in Latin America, the idea may be to commute back and forth, to spend, you know, as the warm months <laughs> south of the border and then come up in the colder months. A question that, of course, we don't know is what they really will do. You know, will they really retire? Uh, will there be pulls of the United States? What happens when they have their children and their grandchildren are all here? Will they still want to go back? I, you know, I mean, it's really an open question. We don't know. So, I mean, that is, that is an issue, uh, clearly. I think one reason that many immigrants want to become citizens is because they want to be able to go back and forth without having to worry about being away for six months, isn't that with the legal permanent resident visa, and then they can't come back. So, I mean, that's another reason why people want to be, you know, they, they want their citizenship. Um, I think many immigrants are worried. They're very worried about future legislation that may harm their benefits. After all, immigrants have seen, not, nothing is permanent, right? After all, immigrants have seen the, the bill that passed in 1996, which cut off cut off benefits for many legal permanent residents, made it in, easier for deportation. You know, immigrants are worried, I think some immigrants are worried that maybe they won't be able to get their social security payments, for example, if they're not in the country. I mean, they're worried about these things. They're trying to kind of, you know, cover themselves, keep all their bases open. Uh, and again, I think, I think that isn't, you know, that many will be, you know, I think the whole study of older immigrants will be something You'll, more people will be joining you in, in that study, uh, you know, and understanding how different family patterns operate in, in terms of taking care of. I think the issue for undocumented immigrants is going to be very important because you know they have so little access to any kind of benefits. I mean, undocumented immigrants in the U.S. are available. I have Medicaid only for emergency purposes. You know, that's it. Uh, you know, many of them have been paying into Social Security, by the way, you know. I mean, I don't, you know, what's going to happen when they get older? I mean, that's a real, a, a very, you know, we're talking about a lot of people. So, you know, and if that continues, don't know. I mean, so I, there are a lot of questions, I think, that arise that, that, that are important. I wonder whether you would agree that mm. part of the hostility toward the new immigrants is because a lot of people have a very rosy image of what the good old days were like, mm. Mm. Uh, such as the assumption that they all learned English, which is, of course, mm. a lot of nonsense. Mm. I personally happen to think it's very convenient to learn English if you live in an English-speaking country, and I did. Mm. But. Uh, mm. Uh, mm the pressure that you have to do mm -hmm. this. Uh, and I, I think a lot of it is, is simple ignorance. They assume it all was much better mm -hmm. than. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the attitude toward immigrants mm -hmm. wasn't that great either. I was baffled the first mm -hmm. time I saw the poem mm -hmm. on the st uh, Statue of Liberty, I believe it is, and where mm -hmm. most of the immigrants came in during the early days. It says something about the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Mm -hmm. And I thought, damn it, am I wretched refuse? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it, it was a strange, and, and there were always prejudices against mm -hmm. the people who were the most different. Mm -hmm. The fact that during World War II, the Germans in this country by and large lived perfectly comfortably. The Japanese were put into camps. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of the notion that everything is terrible now, it always was. <laughs> uh, I, I obviously definitely agree with you. Um, I think also, I just to put a, diff a different twist on it, because I think clearly people do, many people, uh, you know, have a romantic, a, glow, glow, a rosy view of the past, which, which makes it very hard for immigrants. It's impossible for them to live up to these stereotypes. So I think that, that places an extra burden on today's immigrants. But I also think it's, I, when I, I teach, and when I teach at the City University of New York, most of my students are immigrants or children of immigrants. And I think when they hear about the experiences of immigrants in the past, which they know nothing about, uh, they really don't know anything about them. I think actually they feel, it makes them feel, ah, you know, 
Those groups also had a difficult time. We're not alone because what they see is these groups, their descendants, being very successful. And they, you know, they don't, they, it, it, they don't even know. They think, oh my gosh, those groups had a hard time. In fact, it's very hard for them to even think that those groups ever had a hard time. So I think it actually, and, and some of the movements say, oh, you know, maybe, it, I think it gives them hope because they feel, well, if those groups had such a hard time and are doing well now, uh, you know, maybe, you know, we'll be doing just as well in the future. Now, of course, that gets into a whole lot of other issues uh, about the, the future of the, the descendants of immigrants today and how they're doing, right? Are they, I mean, and that's one of the big questions in the literature, right? Are the children and grandchildren of today's immigrants going to emulate the experiences of the earlier way, you know, the earlier children of, of immigrants? And so far, at least, I should tell you that at least the studies that are being done on the second generation do show that the children of immigrants are doing better than their parents in much the same way as in the past. And that's another issue, by the way, where we tend to stereotype and mythologize and often base our, experience, the, our images on the experience of Jews. Perhaps I, because Jews are doing often the writing, and maybe I'm, I'm coming from a New York bias here. Uh, and Jews were a relatively successful group, although it also took them longer than people imagined. I often say it was not my son the doctor, my grandson the doctor. And forget, for example, the experience of Italian immigrants, for example, who were the largest group in the 100 years ago. It took them a very long time to, get, to do better. It took them many more generations to reach parity with the native born. And so far, some of the new immigrant groups, it depends on which ones you're looking at, are actually surpassing the native born. A recent study uh, based on survey data and also qualitative data in the New York area showed, for example, that the Asian groups and the European groups, the Russians, uh, are even in the second generation, are surpassing in education and occupation uh, native born whites in New York. Uh, all the uh, immigrant groups are doing better than native minority groups. And actually, the area, the, the groups that are of most concern in the New York study are Puerto Ricans who have been, by, are not officially immigrants. They are by birth, and even if they're born in Puerto Rico, they are U.S. citizens. And they, their migration to New York was in the 40s and 50s. So actually, that's, maybe that's of a different kind of concern, okay, that that group is lagging so far behind. But so far, the immigrants, at least the story of immigration, now it doesn't include Mexican immigrants, okay, and they, of course, are the big group in that New York study, and they are being, they are being studied. There are other indices, though, that they, they too are doing better than their parents. Now, some people may say, okay, that's not so great because their parents weren't doing very well and so that they're doing better than their parents. So what, you know, that's not so great. But, you know, and, and some studies have said that they may take longer over the generations to reach parity with uh, non-Hispanic non whites than did Italians in the past. But we'll see, I mean, I'm trying to, I think that this is an important question that, you know, looking at the trajectories and the mobility trajectories of, of the children uh, and ultimately the grandchildren of today's immigrants. I can't resist adding two totally different comments. One is I read some years ago a very interesting article about the upward mobility of different immigrant groups. And they compared immigrant groups where if they were really hard up, they took the children out of school. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there were other immigrant groups who, if they were really hard up, the mother went into the labor market. And mm -hmm. guess which groups were more upwardly mobile? Mm -hmm. That's a feminist speaking here. Mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. other comment I want to make that I know, I'm sorry to say, some people who are very opposed to immigrants and they are different and they are mm -hmm. this and that, and my standard comment is you really live, want to live on Anglo-Saxon food for the rest of your life? <laughs> Yes, well, we can thank immigrants for making our food better <laughs> throughout American history. There's a question all the way at the back. Hi, um, I'm Nancy Joseph, and I just have a question about, um, you made a comment saying that the New immigrants are, you know, changing America. It's not just this, you know, unidirectional process. Yeah. And um, I'm thinking about even the notions of race. So we have with the, um, you mm -hmm. know, 
first wave of immigrants coming in and mm -hmm. bringing in this changing the notions of whiteness. So mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. are these new immigrants doing to mm -hmm. these, mm -hmm. you know, previously defined mm -hmm. notions of race? Well, they've had a dramatic effect, clearly, on transforming notions of race. I mean, you know, the black-white binary, as people say, right? We think of race in, what, a fourfold terms now, right? I, on the whole, I mean, that's if you read newspapers, right? Black, white, Asian, Latino. Um, uh, I, I certainly, I'm looking at, 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 at um, people of African ancestry, and I think it depends on where you're looking, you know, what area, but I, again, coming from New York, where I would say at least a third of the um, non-Hispanic black population is for foreign born, and even higher if you include their children. I think um, uh, one, one observer, Milton Vickerman, in a book that I edited on West Indians says that West Indians are tweaking monolithic notions of blackness. And I think he may be right. I think that a, a greater sensitivity to ethnic distinctions among blacks um, than, than had been before. Um, that, that, uh, now, that's not the only factor. Immigration is not the only factor. There's a growing black middle class. I mean, there are other factors that are going on in terms of changing views of, of, of blackness. Um, so I think, yes, immigrants are having a, a and then intermarriage and, and, and new racial mixtures that are occurring as a result of, of immigration. Yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, that's something that's very much being transformed. I mean, there are a lot of speculations about ultimately where this is going. I mean, there are the pessimistic and the, opti you know, the optimistic and the pessimistic, uh, you know, I mean, the pessimistic, I guess, would be saying that we're trend moving towards a, a black, non-black racial order in which, you know, blacks once again will be on the bottom and Asians and uh, light, lighter skinned Latinos will be able to move into a, maybe a new category that won't even be called white. Um, I mean, or there may be other, you know, other scenarios moving down the line, but clearly, I mean, Hispanics are now the largest minority group, 15% of the population. Um, you know, I mean, there's, Asians are growing there's tremendous amount of intermarriage between Latinos and whites, and even more so Asians and whites. I mean, that's obviously changing perceptions and constructions of race. And of course, we have a, you know, I mean, all there are other things going on, and we have, right, a uh, son of an immigrant running, right, a, a, an African immigrant <laughs> running for president. So, I mean, I think clearly, yes, I think immigration is, is a major factor behind evolving, changing conceptions of race. Yeah. Uh, this question could be for anybody in the audience. I want to just look at the question. Um, Nancy mentioned that uh, I'm thinking about the implications of this comparison. And I'm thinking about it not only in sociological and historical terms, but also in political terms. This comparison between these two great generations of immigrants. And Nancy mentioned one possible angle on that, which is from the perspective of uh, let's say, since you were talking about students, immigrant young people today, and the kind of lessons they might draw from the fact that there was this earlier great wave of immigrants. But I'm also interested in uh, the, the uh, implications the other way around. Uh, so mm -hmm. just to grossly overstate mm -hmm. the case, we have this debate about immigration today. And uh, the more we listen to kind of a, a somewhat more systematic comparison, mm -hmm like we heard today, the more we realize that actually, uh, at least my argument would be, I don't want to put my argument in the answer, <laughs> now, but uh, my argument would be that actually the Great Wage are quite comparable. You know, they're mm -hmm. not the same, but I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're really quite comparable mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's important sociologically and historically to, to understand mm -hmm. that. But presumably it has some implications for the way people today, for example, think about immigration. The fact that a lot of this earlier, one little piece of it is the fact that a lot of this earlier generation of immigrants, a lot of those people actually were racialized. I mean, in terms of the way they were kind of understood, perceived by other people mm -hmm. in society. That would seem to have implications for people today mm -hmm. thinking about mm -hmm. immigrants as different, mm -hmm. or in, you know, thinking about it in somewhat racialized terms. Mm -hmm. And this is, this remark is self-interested. Gail and I had a lot of different mm -hmm. purposes in mind in framing the initiative mm -hmm. this year. But one of them certainly was to speak directly to mm -hmm. immigrant youth, especially here at the mm -hmm. university, to get people thinking a little mm -hmm. bit about immigration as a long-term kind of mm -hmm. process in the United States in comparison to the native mm -hmm. generations. 
Well, I think, I mean, just to end, if I can follow up on that, I mean, then the, que the next question becomes how immigrants were racialized, yes. But then the question is how the immigrants in the past who were racialized as in-between peoples or as not fully white, how is it that they became seen as white like others? And then the question is, are we going to be seeing parallel processes going on today? And I, you know, and if so, why? Uh, and that's a whole other conversation. But I mean, that, that does get into, you know, what factors underline the change in the past and whether we're going to be seeing those same factors um, today. I mean, one argument puts a lot on the expansion of jobs and the economy and that there were openings for, uh, for those groups to move up. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, we'll have to see first, wh wh whether that, whether there will be, whether we'll have similar processes, or I mean, I would, or whether there'll be a differences. I don't. I, I, yeah. Why don't we take one more new mm. question over here? Uh, oh, yeah. It's more of a, uh, yeah. I, this is fascinating. Mm. Thank you for mm. Mm. Yeah. Your uh, mm. presentation and and also mm. I really appreciate the conversation that we're mm. having, but this is more of a of a okay. Uh, you we have all this data, this wonderful information. <laughs> Let's say that, okay, uh, January, January 20th, 2009, you know, Nancy Foner, will you please come to Congress and make a case? <laughs> right. I mean, what, what would you tell Congress uh, that, you know, again, because mm -hmm. obviously I agree with what you are saying and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, how far, politically speaking, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. Washington and Congress mm -hmm. in particular, mm -hmm. we've seen what the media has done, we've seen what, uh, you know, also what different congressmen and women have done to, mm -hmm. to influence immigration policy in, mm -hmm. you know, in Washington, mm -hmm. and we've seen the failures of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just have to ask you, I mean, <laughs> what would you say, what would you say in Congress, mm -hmm. uh, you know, given all this work that you've done through the years, uh, mm -hmm. So that it would be again, uh, so that we could move forward in terms of, let's say, that the uh, legalization. Uh, well, that's obviously the key issue. I mean, legalization is the key issue. I mean, uh, you know, we have a country where we have 12 million people who are, you know, don't have a right to live here, and yet they're living here and they're working here, and they've got children. And the other thing, of course, is that many of them are living in mixed status families. I mean, they have children often who are U.S. citizens. There are people of different statuses in their family. It's really an untenable situation. I, I mean, I think it, it will be addressed in some ways. The question is how. I mean, I would support, you know, a pathway to, to citizenship, right? Uh, for, but, you know, a, a legalization program. Um, but, you know, I don't know what's going to happen uh, in terms of how, you know, whoever, whoever gets elected president. I mean, it's obviously currently, it's very interesting, actually that it is completely off the table in the presidential election, right? I mean, neither of the parties, neither of the candidates want to deal with it, right? They don't. They don't want to alienate any one of their potential constituencies because immigration is a funny political issue. It's that classic strange bedfellows issue, right? I mean, that's how, you know, business interests ally with, uh, with immigrant rights groups and liberal groups. I mean, it's a very interesting, right? For, 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 it's a very interesting, and I think because of that, it creates particular problems for politicians. But whoever gets elected, and after the economy, I mean, and, and, and I think another interesting thing, I mean, as the, I, don't, I didn't see the stock market figures today, but as the economy, I mean, which is very alarming, you know, continues to decline, uh, another question really is how is that going to affect attitudes to immigrants and to, to, to legalization? I mean, there may be, I mean, I, I think it's bound to come up, but if the economy worsens and there is more job competition, you know, there may be a greater reluctance to sponsor some of these programs. And then we also see there seems to be a fall off in undocumented immigration coming in anyway. So, I mean, it, it is a, you know, I, I'm just raising some of these issues. And I think that is, if we have an immigration issue that's a political issue in America, that's the political issue. Uh, the other issue that's been, and, and, and the response of local, I mean, we've seen the lack of federal legislation is leading to all these local initiatives, which is, you know, pretty horrific, right? In which they try to, you know, deny undocumented immigrants all kinds of rights. A lot of them are being declared illegal, right? And we see these raids. I mean, it's very upsetting. I mean, in the lack because there is a lack of federal initiative. So, I think we'll see something. <laughs> I don't know what. Um, and of course, it depends on you know it depends on the outcome of the election. But I also think, 
it'll be interesting to, I mean, I think also how the economy plays out in this and how, how much, you know, because politicians are going to be responsive to people who are being hurt by the economy. I, it's a complicated issue. I mean, America wants, you know, people benefit from their, their labor, right? Uh, I mean, and there's a lot of people who, you know, so I mean, it's, it's, but I think that is the key issue today. And I think, you know, a question too is, you know, what's going to happen with their children? Uh, you know, I mean, who are born here and who are growing up, are, are, are they going to be suffering disadvantages from their parents' legal status? I would think it would be an issue. That's one of the questions, by the way, that this large Los Angeles study is now addressing. Uh, children whose parents are U.S. citizens seem to do better. So there does seem to be an edge. So, I mean, I'm just raising, you know, some of these questions. But I think that's, you know, and, and that, of course, that whole dynamic. I know we, I, it's, it's interesting to hear the historians and the social scientists, if I just, I am a sociologist, right? But, but it's interesting because the historians tend to look for continuities over time. Don't, when you think, I, I think there is a tendency to look for continuities over time. And I certainly, you know, do want to bring those out. And I think it's important to bring those out. But there are many differences, too, and I think we can't, you know, and I think this one, this area of undocumented immigration and the way it's playing out is clearly a, a, a very big difference from last time, right, the last great wave. So Nancy got up at four this morning. So <laughs> she's willing, maybe, maybe the baby in the dam can just give one more short question. Oh, okay, sure. Short, okay. Yeah, sure. I can see she's getting tired. I'll just put the question out and then we can discuss it. Mm. Uh, as much as the great wave seems to be similar, mm. I would expect the nativist feelings to also be uh, similar. I mean, the, the, the fear is genuine, and mm -hmm. whatever sources, bases, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and how soft they are, the fear is genuine. And so I would like to discuss, maybe offline, no, then, I think you're uh, right. yeah. why, mm -hmm. what happened last time, mm -hmm. and what can we do this time to engage all, all of them to, to make it better, given that the you know, if patterns are to well, be followed, this is... I mean, the nativism last time led to dire restrictions on immigration. Um, I mean, that's what, how it culminated in 1924 with basically laws that pretty much kept out those groups. I mean, that was the culmination. I don't see that happening today. I really don't. I don't think we're going to get those kinds of dire restrictions. I, you know, I'll eat my words, but I don't see that in the offing. So in that sense, you know, I don't see it in the offing. The other question is really the one that Jim asked, which is, yes, there were these native, you know, anti-immigrant and, and nativist um, a, a nativism, but the groups against which this prejudice was leveled eventually managed to become, I don't know what word, part of the mainstream, become fully white, the prejudice diminished. And the question, I mean, that is the other question. I mean, how did that happen? And will that happen in the future? A complicating factor, I hate to, I, I, is this constant immigration flowing in? I mean, that is the other issue. Because remember, last time, and, and it's, I hate to raise this in that way because Peter Brimelow, I don't know if any of you know him, wrote this anti immigrant screed called Alien Nation, in which you know, he really railed against immigration. And he kept saying, We need a breathing room. <laughs> he kept calling it a breathing room. And by that he meant, just like last time when we cut off immigration, we need to cut it off now so that there's breathing room for groups to assimilate. And I wouldn't argue that at all. But it made it a different experience in the past, I think, you know. So, I, you know, that, that, that was a difference. And, of course, there was a very an expanding economy, particularly in the post-World War II years. You know, Ira Katz-Nelson has also written about when affirmative action was white, all kinds of programs that were available uh, for the children of the second generation to get houses. There was an expansion of education. There were opportunities in the economy. So I think we also have to look at those factors outside of uh, those factors too. Richard Alba, who's someone that I've been writing about on other things, actually has a book that's going to be coming out. He makes the argument that actually there is going to be this expansion because he says there, the, there's going to be a demographic shift in which the whites are going to be retiring from their jobs and they're not going to be enough new people and so that's going to allow a movement up of the children of these new groups. I mean, it's a kind of optimistic view. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> uh, you know, he puts a lot of emphasis on that. I think, you know, these are issues, uh, you know, 
we need to, you know, they're speculative to a large degree, you know, so we'll have to see. I know historians don't like to look ahead, right? I, I, I say these are very speculative. But the past raises the questions inevitably about, you know, how, if that's what happened then, what will happen, you know, in the future? And again, we're in the midst of this immigration, you know, it hasn't ended and we're looking back. It's ongoing, you know, so it's, it's, it's something that keeps, is, it, we, we keep, as, you know, as I speak, new immigrants are coming in, I mean, every day, and so it's something that we're in the midst of. I think as, as a person who studies immigration that this makes it very exciting, but it also makes it, you know, a little, it, it's, it's, it makes it difficult sometimes to, to study or to see what's going to happen in the future. Okay, time for beer. Thank you. <laughs>